In the integrated rangeland management class here at the University of Idaho, we've been talking about grazing and how it affects fire. One really important piece of that puzzle is how grazing affects, affects invasive annuals, especially cheatgrass and medusa head, because those really are the source of a lot of the fire issues in the Great Basin and the sagebrush steppe. So today I'll talk a little bit about what we know about the effect of grazing on invasive annuals. We've seen this graph before, we know that grazing can affect fire fuels, and now we're going to talk about how grazing could affect those invasive annual grasses. Remember, historically, these grasses, uh, cheatgrass, medusa head, uh, red brome, they came into the Great Basin in the 1800s, um, mostly really taken off in 1940s and 50s when we still really started seeing um, widespread um, expansion. They're a challenge, remember, because they're fine textured, so they're very flammable. They also mature early, so they extend the fire year and they increase ignition risk because they're such good fuel. And then overall, the bottom line is they decrease the fire interval to just a few years versus a few decades. Cheatgrass burning, we've seen this slide before. That is the challenge. They are really good fuels. Now, what could we do with that fuel in terms of grazing? Well, grazing and annual plants is, is a little bit problematic because grazing can certainly promote annual grasses. There's several really good studies that showed if you use especially heavy grazing, you can really increase the amount of cheatgrass or medusa head on a site. And we, But on the other hand, we know that grazing does not stop invasion. There's quite a few examples. Um, Kerry Kapuka is one in Idaho. There's several Kapukas in Idaho. Uh, where there's lava all around and the area inside has never been grazed. And yet now today, those areas are heavily invaded by cheatgrass because because uh, the sites, at least in Idaho and the Great Basin, are are really well suited for, say, for uh, cheatgrass. They have the right climate. So when cheatgrass arrives, uh, you can't stop it from invading. So in other words, just not grazing a site is not going to stop invasion. However, grazing can suppress annual grasses if done correctly. It needs to be done with the proper season and also at a time when there's available moisture um, or actually not available moisture for regrowth. Here are some interesting studies done in, Mon in uh, California on medusa head. So medusa head is a big challenge and it's also not very palatable, but it turns out that when the sites that are grazed, especially those that are grazed early in the season, March, April, May, uh, when medusa head is actively growing, um, grazing can really have a, a strong reduction in medusa head cover. So this was two sites in uh, California, 2003 and 2004. And in both cases, the ungrazed site had more biomass than the grazed site in March. But if you can delay grazing to March or April or May, uh, then you can even have greater reduction. What do we know about grazing and cheatgrass? This is an interesting study that was done out of uh, Nevada by Jay Davidson. He was actually looking to see if you could use sheep to not only graze the cheatgrass out, but also um, if you could use it to uh, restore the site. The restoration treatments didn't work, but here are the data that Jay had for sheep grazing. So you see in 2000, there was a control site that was not grazed and there was a sheep graze site, the dark bar. And in 2000, 2001, 2002, you can see there's way less cheatgrass in terms of pounds per acre in the grazed site than the ungrazed site. The real challenge that I see here is that in 2003, they put the sheep back in, or they, um, they I'm sorry, they removed the sheep completely. So the gray and the um, control bar, both of those did not have sheep grazing. And you can see the cheatgrass came right back. So uh, cheatgrass uh, seeds last eight or 10 years at minimum. So if you're going to do control controlled grazing of cheatgrass, you got to stick with it for quite a few years because if you rem if you stop grazing, then cheatgrass will come right back. An interesting study done in northern Arizona, so a little bit out of the Great Basin, but also has uh, some interesting relevance to how grazing might affect cheatgrass. In this case, pretty long study from 1997 to 2004, the green bar in the middle there is, a, is an area where cattle were removed, and the bottom bar, the yellow bar, is one where uh, grazing was moderate. So if you just compare the moderate to the no graze site, you can see that there was more cheatgrass in the no grazed area than there was in the moderate grazed area. The, uh, there was also another uh, treatment in this study, the, the dashed line with the, that has no highlighted color. It was the what they called high impact grazing. So that would be like that management intensive grazing where they graze several times per year 
um, but grazed very heavily. That site um, had more cheatgrass than, um, than the moderate grazing from 97 to 2002, but the real emphasis of this site was on the fact that in 2002 there was a drought, and what happened was that really heavily grazed site really did have an increase in cheatgrass. So the take home message here is um, moderate grazing would be more effective than control, but really heavy grazing could be a, a challenge and really promote cheatgrass, especially in drought years. So it is important to be careful uh, with grazing management in drought years. Here's an interesting picture that I got from Barry Perryman. He's a professor in uh, the, at the University of Nevada, Reno, and this is cheatgrass. This is a really solid standard cheatgrass. What's interesting about this is it, it looks like it could be anywhere in the Great Basin, but this was back in the homeland uh, where cheatgrass uh, comes from. I can't exactly remember where this picture is from. Uh, Uzbekistan, I think, is where it was, but somewhere in that Mediterranean area where cheatgrass came from, this is what it looks like in its native habitat. So it can be really solid stands. Uh, Dr. Perryman has been looking for the last several years and some really promising work on winter grazing to manage cheatgrass. So I'm going to show you a little bit of, of his results from that research. So here's a site that was really well invaded. This is in Nevada now, so it looks not too much different than that, uh, the other picture I showed you. But this is Nevada, heavily invaded site with cheatgrass and some perennial grasses back there. And he grazed it, and a few years later, that same site. Now you can see those perennial grasses, mostly crested wheatgrass, really is really expanding, and there's not much evidence of cheatgrass between those plants. So we went from a nearly completely invaded site to, to this site now that looks really dominated by perennial grasses. Here's another site. This one was in Oregon, uh, the Upton Mountains in Oregon. Uh, it's the Upton Mountain allotment in 2012. You see really dominant by cheatgrass. This is a fall picture taken right before the cattle were put in. There are some perennial grasses there. So they grazed that for a few years. And in 2016, now you can see very little evidence of cheatgrass in the spring and April, when you should see a lot of green coming on. Very little cheatgrass, but a lot of crested wheatgrass and other perennial grasses. So another really good success story of a few years of winter grazing. So those pictures all look really good, but I'm happy to say that Dr. Perryman and his associates have also been doing some research to see if, if there really is a difference. So this was a study uh, that was done by a grad student, Schmelzer, and he was looking at a change in cheatgrass, and his study was from 2007 to 2009, again in Nevada. And what he found was, first of all, in his study, the cheatgrass really did decrease. So in the grazed site, the cheatgrass went from a couple hundred pounds per acre to about 100 pounds per acre, so really decreased over that time. During that same time in the ungrazed area, the cheatgrass stayed about the same from uh, 2007 to 2009. The good thing is that the on that on the site that he studied also the the grazed site had more perennial grasses. Yes, the ungrazed site also had more perennial grasses. That was probably because some just climate differences, etc. Um, but the, the uh, grade site had a lot more perennial grass biomass. So that, that begs the question, why is winter or fall grazing uh, decreasing the amount of cheatgrass? The cheatgrass is dormant during that time, so it's hard to imagine how grazing is affecting the cheatgrass. So if you're trying to answer the question, what is it about grazing that reduces cheatgrass? You look at a site like this and you see there's a lot of just biomass on the soil surface that turns to litter over the winter. And that gives you the clue. Um, the Latin name of cheatgrass is Bromus tectorum. Bromus is because it's an oak grass and tectorum is from the Latin meaning tectum, which means a roof. And this is um, was named because of the tendency of this grass, cheatgrass, to grow on the roofs, the, the old sod roofs. In its, in its homeland. So this plant is used to having a lot of just sod and thatch that it grows on and grows from. So when you remove that thatch, um, you have a chance to reduce the seed viability. So grazing reduces the mulch or litter on the soil surface, and therefore that makes the site more inhospitable for cheatgrass establishment. So this is the going theory, and Dr. Perryman and his colleagues are doing more, but interestingly, just by removing that uh, surface there, it makes the site less hospitable to cheatgrass and, and fine for the perennial grasses. Also another great thing about winter grazing is that those perennial grasses really are not very susceptible to grazing in the winter. So when you put all these pieces together, here's my graph of how I think
grazing influences cheatgrass and probably under other annual grasses like medusa head if you have no grazing cheatgrass will increase to the extent of its range till some other abiotic factor is slowing it down of course the cheatgrass has to get there but at least in uh, north america it's it gets a jump on the perennial grasses and can become established even without uh, livestock grazing Grazing in the early spring, such as a study we saw with sheep and early spring grazing in Nevada, can really be effective. The key to that is to make sure that uh, the plant is continually grazed and, uh, and, and does not allow it to go to seed. So if, there, if you graze it in the spring and then there's a rain, that can be a challenge. So spring grazing can work, but you have to somehow uh, keep ahead of it if, the, if, you you know, if you have spring rain. You also need to get off the cheatgrass before the peak biomass of the perennial grasses because we know that if you graze uh, cheatgrass at that time, the cattle will probably uh, graze the perennial grasses because they're better as the cheatgrass becomes dormant. They would switch their um, grazing to the perennial grasses and therefore they would suppress the competitiveness of the grasses and the cheatgrass wins. However, now we're also seeing that dormant season grazing, that winter and fall grazing, could really be, t be a time when we could reduce the viability of the seed bed and really remove uh, the dominance of cheatgrass from ecosystems. So the answer to the question, does grazing, uh, is, good, is it uh, promote or suppress cheatgrass? The answer is yes. If you want to know more about grazing uh, cheatgrass and other annuals, uh, this is a really great guide called the Green and Brown Guide. It's out of the um, Science-Based Solutions for Invasive Annual Grasses at ebipm.org. So go to that website, download the Green and Brown Guide. It will give you kind of step-by-step -step, uh, grazing uh, approaches. So grazing in annuals, what do we really know? We know that cheatgrass is palatable when it's young. And we also know that it's unpalatable when it gets red and and um and stemmy. However, when it gets really dormant, like this picture to the right, it can be quite palatable again, and animals can use it, and and, uh, and it has good nutritive value because those stems are, are not very strong. So grazing can reduce cheatgrass early spring or late season in the winter and fall, but grazing can also increase cheatgrass if it's done at the time when the uh, perennial grasses in the ecosystem are also growing. Those are a few tidbits for how grazing can affect invasives, and I can't say that we know all the answers yet, but we are learning.